Welcome to Civic Buzz, a program of the League of Women Voters Minneapolis. I'm Ellen Van I Warden, Program Director for the League, and I'll be moderating our presentation tonight. The League is a nonpartisan political organization that encourages informed and active participation in all levels of government, works to increase understanding of major policy issues, and influences public policy through um, education and advocacy. I'm thrilled to be helping the League with this critical work and encourage you, if you're not already a member, to join us. You can find out more at lwvmpls.org. Tonight, I'm honored to present Kim Havey, the Director of Sustainability for the City of Minneapolis. Kim will be speaking on the sustainability efforts at the city and what we can do to help. Kim is responsible for the development of policy and programs to support the city's climate action plan, greenhouse gas reduction goals, and elevate environmental justice programs and policies to increase health and wealth in low-income communities of color. In March 2021, Kim was appointed to serve on the first ever White House Environmental Justice Advisory Committee. You will be able to ask your questions directly to Kim when he has concluded his remarks. Thank you for coming and we look forward to your questions. Kim, thank you, welcome and take it away. Great, thank you, Ellen. Uh, as Ellen said, my name's Kim Havey. I use he, him, his pronouns. And uh, I like to use the pronouns um, because with my name being Kim, I used to have to have on my business cards, Mr. Kim Havey. And uh, that was even a little more confusing because about half the people ended up calling me Mr. Kim. So <laughs> I like the use of he, him. I don't have to use Mr. anymore. Uh, anyway, as I was saying, my name's Kim Havey. I'm the son of the late Wayne and Evelyn Havey of Sheboygan Falls, Wisconsin. And I'm presenting to you from the ancestral homeland of the Dakota people, now called Minneapolis. I want to thank you for joining tonight to discuss climate change and what the city of Minneapolis and all of us can do to reduce the causes of climate change and mitigate the climate effects we'll be facing. So this is a photo of Earth taken in 1972 from the last uh, Apollo mission, Apollo 17. And it's really um, one of the first photos that was ever taken of the entire Earth and even got the North and the South Pole in. It's referred to as the blue marble and some say it's the most uh, uh, reproduced photograph in history. What makes this photograph so unique and powerful is that it really captures the complete Earth, helping us really see the big picture of our planet and how our lives are intricately entwined with it. And it's really an amazing uh, thing to consider that um, this is where we live amongst the stars. <clears throat> this is actually a photo of the sun shining over the Earth's horizon through the two lowermost layers of the atmosphere, the troposphere and the stratosphere. And it's this is what we call the, the layer that surrounds our, our Earth is really only uh, a very, very thin and delicate layer. Um, and so it is this that is really intricately involved in the aspects of uh, climate change. And so nearly half of the solar energy that reaches the top of the Earth's atmosphere is absorbed by the Earth's planet surface. About 29% is reflected and about 23% is absorbed by the atmosphere. And what's really causing the effects in climate change is the atmosphere is holding more and more of that heat and less of it is escaping out into the space again, creating what we now know as the greenhouse gas effect. What's causing it? We know a lot about. Um, we spew about 110 million tons of man-made global warming pollution into the thin shell of our atmosphere every 24 hours. So we know that this is having an effect, but where are they? coming from. This graphic representation shows all the major sources or the majority of major sources coming from greenhouse gas emissions. Obviously, a lot of it comes from things like fossil fuel, 
production, refinement, use and transportation, but we also get a lot of fossil fuel generation from industrial agriculture, uh, large scale coal mining, and of course, uh, forest burning, and now more recently, a uh, rapid thawing of the permafrost in Canada and uh, in Russia and other areas. So in the next 50 years, Minnesota is projected to experience 30 more days with temperatures above 90 degrees. That means right now we're at about 13 days on average. So we're gonna be at about 45 days on average where we'll have 90 degrees or hotter temperatures. And we'll have 30 days or a month, fewer days with temperatures below freezing on, on average. <clears throat> so this is a very significant uh, change in just a relatively short period of time. This image is actually from Ed Hawkins' Show Your Stripes Project, and it visually represents the change in temperature from 1895 through 2018. And each stripe represents the average temperature for a specific year, and the color represents how much lower or higher that temperature was than the average for the 20th century. It's important to keep this data in mind as we work every day towards bettering our environment and battling climate change. And what you can see there is the last about 20% of this climate stripe illustration is pretty much all red and, and orange and very different from the other side of the left, left side of this. So with every incremental change we look at in the global record of change, it actually translates into a very amplified change in Minnesota's uh, backyard in our own climate environment. And this is according, according to Mark Seeley, who many folks know from his work on uh, NPR and, and some other obviously very interesting things. So um, the warming is apparent not only in the increase in sea surface temperatures, but in the increasing of temperatures deep in the ocean. And with warmer ocean waters and air temperatures above them result in increased evaporation, that water vapor from the ocean goes into the atmosphere. The warmer atmosphere holds more water vapor. And for every one degree Fahrenheit of warming, the atmosphere can hold 4% more water vapor. And when we're talking about climate change, we're using Celsius since we're still the only country in the world that hasn't adopted the metric system uh, for many things. This means that every one degree in Celsius warming, and we're trying to keep it down to 1.5 degrees Celsius or less in global warming, translates into 7% more water vapor in the air. And this increased water vapor is what creates these massive storm systems that draw in this, that produce heavier rainfalls, faster rainfalls, increasing the risk, obviously, of flooding, mudslides, uh, and other um, very uh, dangerous types of storms. And so this is actually a, a photo, sometimes known as a rain bomb, um, from Montana that really shows a, a tremendous amount of extra heat and what that can do, amplified in a very humid environment. So that doesn't just happen out on the Great West. We had, you might remember back in 2019, we had some very significant floods in early June. And this is a picture from Lakeville um, of the significant floods. So as we get warmer, this extra heat intensifies the water cycle and increases the likelihood of very, for ferocious downpours and um, uh, uh, increased flooding opportunities. This is actually a picture of Noah's Ark. It's a replica um, or a, a not replica, but something they think it is like Noah's Ark. It's, um, it, it's uh, the Noah's Ark at Ark Encounter theme park. And uh, it's in Williamson, uh, Kentucky. And one of the interesting things about this and talking about floods, this project actually um, sued the insurers in May of 2019 for this, uh, damage due to historic rainfall events and won. So this, <laughs> or this historic arc um, got severely damaged by massive floods, ironically, and uh, the insurers didn't want to have to pay for it. But anyway, they ended up having to pay for it. So the world is a crazy place. Uh, North Bonneville, Washington. This is guys playing golf. I know Ellen, we were talking earlier before the, this thing started, but you got to have some cool nerves on the golf course to be able to 
uh, be playing well a forest fire like that is burning. But, you know, wildfires are increasing in size and intensity and duration, burning hotter, longer, fire seasons are lasting longer. And um, this is actually pushing more, uh, more uh, carbon dioxide into the air, sort of exacerbating extremely the amount of um, carbon being uh, brought in. So these are a constant threat. And one of the things about that's interesting about it is that the majority of wildfires are actually uh, man-made or human caused. And of course, we love to keep expanding the oil and gas industry. And um, this is a very interesting map that shows since 1986, all the amounts of injuries, property damage that's been caused by significant uh, pipeline failures in the United States. And so there's been well over uh, a thousand injuries um, and hundreds of deaths related to this. Um, and so we really, <laughs> it seems like an isolated problem because we hear of line three and things like that, but really it is a major expansion investment in pipelines that are continuing to foster the fossil fuel industry. And so if we're gonna be able to tackle industry, or tackle climate change, we have to stop creating the infrastructure that's used to, to create more hydrocarbons in the air. And, you know, just some really interesting other points, you know, um, climate change has caused droughts in Russia. You know, you hear about things going on now with Ukraine and how they're the breadbasket of Europe. Well, they're the ones also that feed Russia and, and uh, Ukraine also feed much of Africa. And this is in 2011, but this is, and this was the start of the Arab Spring. And what this fight that they were having over was the increased cost of food and the lack of food that was available. So people were rioting for lack of food in the streets. And this is what started the, uh, the Arab Spring that spread throughout the Middle East. And, you know, this is some uh, impacts that we see also of global climate change, the amount of climate immigrants and refugees that we'll be experiencing as certain areas become very difficult to, to live in. <clears throat> so ultimately, um, there is an extremely high cost of carbon. And we have to understand that these externalities are being borne by folks that are actually the least able to deal with these folks that have had the, the greatest impact from the use of carbon and pollution um, have actually really been the ones that have suffered the most. And according to the World Economic Forum uh, in 2018, they said that the greatest threat to the global economy is climate change. And then one more, backing it up, Pope Francis and the his environmental encyclical said the gravest effects of the attacks on the environment are suffered by the poorest. So this is I, <laughs> but, uh, safe to say an extremely urgent um, issue to be dealing with and I appreciate that you are Take, are very interested in it. It has a lot of um, fact and background and stats, but what can we do here in Minneapolis? And that's what we're focusing on next. <clears throat> so since, 19, since 2006, when we started doing greenhouse uh, gas inventory emissions, um, we've experienced a 32% decline in uh, greenhouse gas while seeing our gross domestic product in Minneapolis increase by 30%. I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail. We've had been doing very well on the work on the programming that we do and on our policies that we set to really be recognized nationwide and worldwide. Um, we were ranked for now the third year in a row by the American uh, Council on Energy Efficient Economies, the fourth most energy efficient city in North America. We're typically the only one in anywhere in the middle of America. And we typically compete as we do in this case with places like Seattle, Washington, D.C., and New York. Um, and so we're really proud to keep our, uh, our status as a um, very active and vanguard city on climate action. So what's been happening on, on greenhouse gas emissions in the city, as I said, we're down 32%. A really big drop happened um, in, in 2020 from 2019, and I'll explain a little bit of that. Um, so sustainability is the department ma uh, that manages and tracks uh, total greenhouse gas emissions for city operations, as well as for our total community, the city at, at large. And that report is completed every August showing the total emissions from scope one and scope two 
emissions from the five main sectors of fossil natural gas, electricity, transportation, solid waste, and, and wastewater. And uh, <clears throat> our G GHG emissions decreased 14% in 2020 compared to 2019. And emissions decreased from electricity, fossil natural gas, transportation, and wastewater, but were greater from solid waste, which makes a lot of sense because people were you know, ordering out more and having a lot of things delivered during the COVID pandemic uh, times. So a significant amount of impact was related to the COVID pandemic. We saw traffic volumes down by 25%. Overall electricity in the city was usage was down 5%. And then uh, with these two factors that actually contribute to a decrease of about 5% on total emissions. But these are also likely to be short-term pandemic anomalies, particularly the traffic volume. So fossil natural gas has been our largest source of greenhouse gas emissions over the last four years. And that's, that changed back in 2017 when electricity use, uh, elect, uh, uh, carbon from electricity generation was the most significant carbon producer. And um, almost all our reductions are over the last uh, uh, 10 or 15 years now are, re are mainly due to renewable energy from the electricity uh, sector. Gas is actually trending up in most cases. This last year we had a down year, but if you trend lined it out, it actually trends upward um, and is really the biggest barrier that we have towards achieving our, our, our greenhouse gas emissions. We are, it's a very, very challenging um, uh, topic to decarbonize the natural gas, but we're, we're really working on that. It's becoming our top priority with our clean energy partnership. So we've been doing a lot to try to decrease that through energy efficiency. Um, so we have a lot of variation year to year, which shows that our housing and building stock is not, is not well insulated because depending on the temperature, it can be up, uh, uh, gas use can be up five or 10% from one year to the next. And so we're really focusing on constructing new buildings to the highest energy efficiency standards, upgrading existing buildings with air sealing and insulation. Um, this is gonna reduce the use of gas and electricity and also save consumers a lot of money. We're looking at 30 to 40% reductions in energy costs when we do insulation and weatherization. We're also working forward with new uh, policies. And then 2020, we adopted a new sustainable build, building policy for affordable housing and adopted a 2021 sustainable building policy for new city buildings. And then in 2022, we're gonna be coming out with a new policy for all city invested in buildings and a pathway for private buildings to go to net zero energy buildings within the next decade. We're also working with a coalition of cities and other organizations um, across the state of Minnesota representing more than a million people and more than a third of the, the state's gross domestic product to develop a uh, stretch energy code that will provide a pathway forward to net zero energy commercial buildings uh, by 2036. So we really have to stop adding to the problem is part of what we're really focusing on but we have to work with the state because a lot of our, our actions are preempted by um, the state. And so we have to look for ways to get legislation passed to support that, our efforts in many ways. This is just a quick graphic that shows the um, uh, breakdown and the percentage of emissions in 2020. So you can see electricity is fairly small on road compared to natural gas. And just four years ago, electricity was more than natural gas uh, as a percentage of our emissions. So we are all moving uh, rapidly uh, towards a 100% renewable electricity um, for all of our city operations. And that all, that's in place for 2023 and by 2030 uh, citywide. And so we're not only are getting to renewable electricity, but we're also gonna then gonna be looking to switch and electrify as many things as we can um, so that we'll be decarbonizing fossil gas but as we're doing it, we're gonna be switching over to renewable electricity and not fossil fueled electricity. Um, in 2022, sustainability will lead an effort to update the 2013 Climate Action Plan to a Climate Action and Equity Plan 
As part of these efforts, the new G, our new greenhouse gas goal will be adopted. We plan to bring forward this recommendation at the end of the year for what's called science-based fair share climate targets that call for an accelerated reduction in GHG emissions uh, represented here by the inverted S-curve. Rather than a point in time to hit a target, the S-curve provides a more precise method to track success. And the new goals will become the foundation of the climate action equity plan strategies and will align with the Climate Mayor's Conference, C40's Race to Zero, and uh, the IPCC uh, protocols from the 2015 Paris Accord. So we're really looking at, um, rather than saying we're gonna reduce 30% by 2025 and 80% by 2050, which gives you a lot of leeway and where you fall and you might hit the, the target like we did this last year in 2020, but it could be an anomaly. But we're saying we're gonna create a steady path and also in conjunction with this, we're able to now define what we call a total carbon budget. And this is um, a carbon budget represents the city's fair share of carbon emissions. It can reduce between now and 2050 to stay within a 1.5 degree C global temperature increase. <clears throat> so if we continue to emit greenhouse gas emissions at the same rate as we did in 2020, which we did have a reduction, we would use up our 30 year carbon budget in the next 10 years. So the carbon budget is the total amount of carbon that we can commit uh, to based on our, our population um, in order to maintain the 1.5 degrees Celsius increase. So, so our city of, city of Minneapolis Sustainability Division works around social equality, economic opportunity, and of course focuses on our greenhouse gas and environmental sustainability, but we really focus on how to use this green transition and just transition to uh, increase the health and wealth of our community members, especially those who've been on the front line and experienced more pollution and cumulative pollution. So one of the things we've focused on, and we've gotten a lot of, of, of support from across the country, a lot of folks went in to learn more about what we do on environmental justice and climate resilience. And we started off with a climate change vulnerability assessment. We uh, passed, uh, resolution to establish green zone advisory councils to focus on EJ community priorities. We looked at climate preparedness events and work with community partners around climate uh, adaptation preparedness. And now we're initiating a new effort around resilient hubs and, co and communities. So climate change vulnerability um, looks at many different things such as you know, who's most affected by the urban heat island what types of populations are more vulnerable due to age, health conditions, asthma rates, and then also looking at things like flooding, green space, and a number of different characteristics. I think there was a total of 17 characteristics that we looked at. And from that, we actually put together the green zones boundaries, which are the outlined in the lime green. But you can see the red area are the areas that actually were in the top, were in the 90th percentile for the top 10% um, of the vulnerability uh, within the city. So what is a green zone uh, initiative? It's a place-based policy aimed at improving health and supporting economic development through environmentally conscious community efforts and communities that face the cumulative effects of environmental pollution, as well as social, political, racial, and economic vulnerability. I also wanna note that race is implied in what makes up a green zone, but it should be more Explicit as the green zone, green zone communities are majority black, indigenous, and communities of color. But it's difficult to track that, and there's a lot of complications involved in it. But I just want to say there's a lot of direct relationship to race and, and climate vulnerability. Um, so in 2017, as I mentioned, the city council adopted a resolution establishing the north side and south side green zones based on the vulnerability assessment. And the green zones are now being used in various city programs and policies such as the green cost share program to prioritize city resources into these areas. And the green zones have received national and uh, statewide attention, most recently highlighted uh, uh, in the ACEEE city scorecard, as I mentioned, uh, where we were ranked uh, fourth. So uh, a very creative, interesting um, uh, program and policy that we work on and on uh, May 21st for the Connecting Communities or Community Connections Conference, which is being put on by the city and the neighborhood groups, uh, we're gonna be having a 
Green Zone Summit on Environmental Justice um, in Minneapolis. We've been working a lot on doing direct um, relationship building and trust building with many different residents and organizations, uh, really focusing a lot on storytelling, how to talk about climate impacts of, on health um, through community art workshops, things like that. And we are also been really excited to be working with the Little Earth United Tribes to do a major um, improvement to their 212 units of housing, all of which are considered to be affordable under HUD. So we're doing a part of the federal money that's coming out of the, the funding um, for, uh, from the federal government is gonna be used to uh, increase the um, insulation, air sealing, and reduce the uh, energy cost of uh, the homes of nearly a thousand people in Little Earth, um, the largest, uh, largest urban Indian community housing in the United States. And we're also working with them on a resilience hub which we're gonna be um, creating a uh, program as part of their community center to act as an emergency resource, but also build um, on the uses of, uh, of their community center to offer other kinds of classes and things around gardening, uh, healthy eating, um, energy technology, job training, lots of really cool things. Um, and then uh, this also shows a little bit about um, the different aspects that um, resilience hubs have. So no two hubs are alike. And um, we're doing a pilot project um, with a number of different organizations, Sabathany Community Center, Renewable Energy Partners, uh, and the Minneapolis Public Schools around the Nutrition Center, um, as well as the um, Minneapolis American Indian Center on Franklin Avenue. And we have uh, are working with um, XL Energy to commit about $6 million to a solar plus storage microgrid initiative for all, all of those organizations, all of those properties and organizations involved in that, which would allow them to be able to withstand <clears throat> uh, multiple days uh, with power outages and act as a resilient um, hub for community, including city emergency services, food distribution, uh, access to the internet, um, et cetera. So, um, but also really creating opportunities to improve energy efficiency in the community and healthy lifestyles, et cetera. Um, and one of our other big things is um, folks might've heard of, we work very closely with our utility companies um, in, and uh, on our clean energy partnership. And so this was uh, entered into with the city in 2016 with Excel and CenterPoint which the utilities are committed to working with the city to meet its climate goals. And from this, we also have what's called a franchise fee and we utilize a 0.5% franchise fee, fee or about $3 million to support sustainability efforts. And so of that, that supports my staff of five, as well as we do about $2.2 million annually in energy efficiency and renewable energy programming, including um, a green cost share matching grant program for businesses, 0% loan financing, free home energy squad audits for more than a thousand homes. And of course, many of the other things um, we do, like I mentioned with Little Earth. And overall, the Minneapolis Clean Energy Partnership has led to 23 collaborative activities that were adopted and under, undertaken from 2019 to 2021. This slide shows just some of the key metrics that we track on the annual progress of the work plan. So red meaning we're not going to get, get there uh, <laughs> at this point. Um, green meaning we're, we're doing real well. Yellow, we're not quite sure yet. Um, so uh, we, we use this uh, tracking uh, on a quarterly basis to see how we're going. Um, I also wanted to uh, mention that we're doing a lot of work around um, building benchmarking. Um, and of course, commercial buildings over 50,000 square feet are involved in this. We also have a truth and sale of housing energy report scorecard. We're one of the first cities in the country to have that. And we're one of the first cities in the country to also have a time of lease or time of rent energy disclosure requirement for all rental properties. So uh, we, we benchmark about 417 uh, commercial buildings that are, are office buildings. We have about a similar amount that are high rise residential buildings of 50,000 square feet or more. Um, and this represents a very significant amount of the actual carbon we produce 
because in Minneapolis, the built environment, all our commercial residential single family represent about 70% of our emissions uh, in, the, in the city. We can do a lot more on solar penetration as well. And that's why we're looking to have a 30% by 30, which means getting 30% of our, our um, electricity from uh, local uh, solar. And we can do a lot better. As you can see from here, we have a, currently have about 24 watts per capita in Minneapolis. And of course, on the other extreme is Honolulu at 606 watts per capita of people living in there. But even Denver has 330. So we have a lot more a lot, a lot of way to go um, to achieve our, our, or get close to maximizing our on-site solar penetration, which also really is helpful to um, support local job creation, support local workforce training, uh, to provide wealth and reduce energy costs for the people that have these resources. And just to, again, illustrate how amazing it is to go through the solar revolution, you can see that, um, here, this shows that um, we went from about 2013, in which we, we had around 40, me 40 megawatts cumulative of solar, uh, to now, um, this is in just an end of 2018, uh, where we have nearly 1,200 megawatts of solar installed in Minnesota. And Minnesota ranks 13th in the, in the country in solar capacity, and we have enough solar energy in Minnesota to power 159,000 average homes. Community solar gardens, we've been a leader on as well too. We have the largest amount of uh, community solar gardens in the country with more than a gigawatt under development. Minneapolis specifically has developed uh, five megawatts of low income solar, meaning uh, available to folks at 60% or less of area median income, supporting the effort to lower uh, electric bills by 30% uh, for more than a thousand households in the city of Minneapolis. And over the last five years, solar energy jobs have grown six times faster than the overall economy. So one of the things we've been really trying to focus on the last couple of years is connecting workforce development with STEM pathway career ladders in the energy and uh, sustainability environmental areas. We're really focusing on trying to diversify utility union and uh, contractors in this field uh, and really look to try to work with low-income and underserved communities to really share in this transition to uh, a green economy and one that uh, relies on uh, renewable energy. So we have more than 11 million people nationwide uh, employed in the energy industry, but that is uh, only fifth in the world as far as the number. China has more than five times we do. We've recently, in the last few years, been taking a very active role in regula regulatory policy at the Public Utilities Commission and through public input and working on legislation. And we've had some tremendous impact in this area. We were very involved in getting a very successful integrated resource plan, which actually stopped the development of an 1100 megawatt gas plant in Becker to replace the closing of one of their coal plants and instead got more than almost a gigawatt of new solar being installed in its, in its uh, place. So we're really pushing hard against investing in long-term fossil fuel-based uh, power production. And, and in 10 years from now, that, that will be high cost and be a stranded asset, which ratepayers will be required to have to, to pay. Um, we're really interested in getting, again, more solar penetration, ramping up our energy efficiency and weatherization programs, and increasing the amount of electrical vehicle um, charging opportunities they are both in homes and businesses and throughout um, parking lots and things like that. So very interested in moving that, move that ball forward as well. And then we have a number of programs. We're fo focusing on affordable and resilient housing. One of the things that makes a house resilient is its ability to withstand changes in heat and temperature without using power. And so the more resilient we can make homes um, uh, in uh, the better off we're going to be able to be more adaptable and resilient. But we're focusing first on naturally occur occurring affordable housing, uh, lead and healthy homes projects that have uh, lead uh, um, in their homes. We're also going through weatherization and energy efficiency at the same time now. We're adding solar to homes that are being weatherized as well when we can. 
we're incentivizing and providing incentives and increasing standards around net zero energy and passive homes. And we've actually are getting 21 new passive built homes built as part of Minneapolis Homes Affordable Housing, which would be available to new homeowners in, in Minneapolis. <clears throat> and of course, the 2030 plans really focusing a lot on increasing housing density, improving green space by planting thousands of trees and centering electri um, electrified transportation mobility hubs throughout the city. The goal for mobility hubs, which I just love, is to be able to put uh, elect all electric mobility options, bikes, um, electric cars, car sharing, uh, uh, car ride sharing, and transit all together at hubs in which 75% of the population of Minneapolis and St. Paul will, will be within a 10 minute walk of any of these hubs, creating an opportunity to be able to really truly live car free. Talk about buses, we have a lot of buses here. I'm happy to say that well, Minneapolis, or I should say Minnesota is gonna benefit a lot. This is a picture of uh, electric buses being built in um, the new fire industries facility in St. Cloud. They also have a facility um, up near um, Duluth as well too. So they're making them as fast as they possibly can. Um, but in general, the transportation sector becomes our second biggest uh, battle to achieving uh, greenhouse gas reductions. And so we really need to be focusing on how we can reduce um, our dependency by reducing um, our number of vehicle miles traveled by creating more walkable, close, close and integrated mixed use communities, um, but also by uh, transferring over to electric vehicles. And really interesting um, to think about that um, it took five years to sell the first million electric passenger cars, it took 17 months to sell the second million, and just six months to go from 3 million to 4 million cars sold worldwide. These are 27 cities that are committed to only buying um, uh, zero emission buses starting in 2025. We're very committed to that. I've been working closely with the Met Council to support their bus electrification plan and to bring uh, electrified buses into Minneapolis. Um, also want to point out, we're still focusing on Paris and Accord. And, you know, of course, we, we did have uh, work that happened in, in uh, Scotland at, at COP26, but ultimately, this is the Paris Accord that set the, uh, the greenhouse gas emission targets. And it's interesting to note that every nation in the world agreed, agreed to those. This is, a, and, and we can change. The world can change very rapidly. This actually goes from 2005 to 2017, just 12 years. And these are proposed new coal plants that were on the books that were defeated. These are coal plants that have been retired in that 12 year period of time. And these ones are coal plants that have announced retirement in that period of time. So we've gone to, uh, from a country that has the majority of their electricity now being produced or formally being produced by um, coal plants to a, a country in which we're installing more renewables uh, in the country than we are combined coal, gas, and nuclear plants combined. <laughs> little drama. Anyway, and this is just to really emphasize the point. This is the Kentucky Coal Mining Museum. They installed 60 kilowatts of solar uh, in 2017 or, and are saving eight to $10,000 a year uh, by having this in here. So they uh, sent out a very uh, excited um, uh, uh, press release on this. And um, they indicated that um, this is, a, this is a municipal utility um, that they'll be able to uh, generate the equivalent of uh, 500 homes um, from this particular installation, generate the electricity equivalent to 500 homes. So our priorities in Minneapolis as we're going forward, as I mentioned, we're really looking to update our climate equity and now equity plan. Um, so reestablishing targets, setting new strategies, updating the work we do there. Um, putting in place our economic development, sustainable building policies, and also our hopefully our statewide policy that will allow us to, to put a pathway to net zero energy buildings. We're gonna to continue to 
participate heavily in the Public Utilities Commission. We have a big docket on tariff on bill inclusive financing coming up in the next month. Um, we're going to work hard on the integration of the, of the implementation of the new integrated resource plan. And then we also have a new bill that was passed that allows for more electrification and fuel switching, known as the Eco Act. So we're involved in discussions there with the state. Um, we're going to implement the time of rent. So basically every single unit of rental housing in Minneapolis, except for individual units like rented and condo buildings, will there'll be a public web website that they'll be able to compare. The information is going to be um, uh, combined uh, in a confidence interval process. So you won't be able to look at the exact amount, but we'll be able to look at proximate amounts and compare them amongst different similar types of units by square footage and by bedroom size to see which um, apartment is more energy efficient. Um, we're working on developing a building electrification program with the Rocky Mountain Institute and we're working with um, St. Louis Park, Edina uh, and um, uh, Eden Prairie on this as part of the Rocky Mountain Institute um, group. So we're hoping to roll out a a multi-city program on that together. Um, we're doing 22 different municipal solar energy projects this next year, producing about five megawatts of solar on city buildings. And then we're also working with very exciting, working with new ownership of the downtown district energy facility in Minneapolis, which provides heat and electricity to more than 55 million square feet. Um, we are working with them to develop a decarbonization plan for the downtown district energy system. If we were able to de reduce carbon emissions by 30% of that downtown district energy system, it would be the equivalent of making every single single family home in Minneapolis net zero energy. That's how significant it is. So working on that for five years is like weatherizing 80,000 houses. It's like, uh, it's just tremendous amount of uh, leverage, but we're excited that, that they're excited about really working with us on it. So, Here's some things that you can do. We didn't talk about this much, but you know, environmental justice, ra racial equity, become engaged. Uh, where we have uh, environmental just development uh, and equity, uh, we're gonna be you know, seeing things that, that will reduce our impact on climate change. Um, I didn't talk about this too much either, but the food represents about 30% of a, a, a carbon's personal footprint. And so eating meat, twice a week can actually reduce your personal carbon footprint, including what you use on your house and driving in cars by about 10%. Electrify appliances. You know, we've got the new induction ranges and stoves. We now have new water heaters, electric dryers, and combine that with renewable electricity. So <clears throat> a lot of things won't go through all those, but, um, you know, certainly uh, there's things that you can do that are Pretty straightforward and other things that may take some more efforts, but um, uh, we all can do some things and together and with good public policy uh, and collaboration with industry, um, we can make all this, we can make this happen. So this is an interesting quote by, um, from a Wallace Stevens poem called The Well-Dressed Man with the Beard. And um, I thought it was pretty appropriate for this type of discussion because it's been told you can't do it, it's too expensive, won't be happen, impossible, don't have the technology, every single excuse under the book. But after the final no, there comes a yes. And that's where we need to focus. We need to get to yes on a lot of things and do it quicker and faster than we have ever before. Because that's where we're living. That's the only place we got. And um, it's... Uh, it's a beautiful world that we need to take some faster action to preserve. And uh, I hope that we can um, see government and business and world leadership come together on this issue uh, once and for all. So thank you very much um, and be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you so much, Kim. That was wonderful, I really appreciate it. Sure, I'll switch that off. Okay, yeah, then we'll be able to see the gallery. We normally just let people unmute themselves and ask their question if they want to. Um, if you don't wanna ask it yourself, type it into the chat and I'll ask it for you. Um, but uh, we can start questions now.
Okay, I'll start. So just to kick it off, this is Jane Lansing. Um, great presentation. Thank you very much, Kim. Um, I had a question. I think a lot of the charts that you showed at the beginning showed like the carbon and emissions for the city operations. And do you do total carbon emissions for the city of Minneapolis, looking at all the citizenry and looking at like the power plants and how much we all consume and looking for the city as a whole? Uh, yes, we do. So yeah, we do. Um, we do look at the total amount of emissions in the city and we, we work with the utilities to do that. So we know how much natural gas is piped into all Minneapolis customers. We know how much electricity is used within the city. And then we actually discount it for the amount of installations of renewable energy that are produced or used like from wind source or for on-site solar energy in the city. So that's how we get to what we call a carbon intensity uh, number for per megawatt hour. And then we know how much megawatt hours of electricity are used and that's how we get the calculation. So, so how, I mean, you don't have to pull it up or anything, but how, how what's, what does that trend chart generally look like for the city as a whole? Is it moving? Um, where we're seeing, a, where, we're, where it is moving is we're seeing a rapid decarbonization of the electricity side. That's where we've been seeing the most energy savings. So overall, as of 2020, over 14 years from 2006 to 2020, we reduced our overall emissions citywide from all carbon emissions by 32%. That's actually really good. Um, the state it, total has only reduced carbon emissions for in that same time period by 5%. Now we have some advantages because we're more urban communities. So we have more transit and things. So transportation is a much bigger piece of the carbon emissions outside of the metro area than it is in the metro area. But nonetheless, it's pretty, it's really good. Um, and we're trying to, you know, always push for policies that can accelerate, you know, energy efficiency and the use of renewable energy. So that's why we have a new policy coming out. Um, about 30% by 2030, 30% of our electricity being either through um, rooftop solar, community solar gardens, or for green tariff programs like wind source. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Dot, I see your hand up. Oh, maybe Glenna, do you wanna go? I see maybe it was yours first. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm not quite sure how to phrase this, this question. Um, because it, it's, it has an embedded concern. And one of the concern is that I think it's part of, of the energy, global warming, energy conservation, global warming, is the removal of parking. Um, uh -huh. And this is having extremely negative business am, impacts. Um, because people now just drive to the suburbs to do their shopping because there's no place to park. Uh -huh. And it's getting worse before it, it's going to get better. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering, you know, what is the coordination across agencies and with local businesses and neighborhood associations and those kinds of groups to address the fact that, <clears throat> that for example, uptown is headed toward desert status. You know, the, the removal uh -huh. of parking in Uptown has been a disaster. Uh -huh. um, so I'm, that's kind of the uh, concern and the question about what kind of planning for those sorts of impacts. I mean, I really don't want to drive to a diner to shop, but I feel like I have to because there's nowhere to plot park near me. Uh -huh. um, not everybody can walk 10 minutes. Um, I still can, but if I'm lucky and live long enough, there will be a day when I can't. Um, so that's part of, that's one question. The second question is, you mentioned uh, St. Louis Park and Edina and Eden Prairie, but you didn't mention St. Paul. Do we have things where we are cooperating with St. Paul and what are they doing you know, compared with us. That's a big thing, I realize. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so on, you know, on the parking, I mean, it is, um, it is one of those things where uh, 
we we're not my group doesn't do the the development of the transportation plans um so i don't we don't interact on those decisions as far as the amount of parking that's in there though we support decarbonizing transportation which in one case in, in some cases is at least within the transportation action plan does recommend you know doing more things that reduce dependency on cars i don't have a good answer for you i i will say i I appreciate that. And I know we mentioned Craig Wilson earlier today, but he was someone who called me on that topic too. Uh, and um, it's something we have to give some more consideration of, I think in the, certainly in the near term that we're not quite there to be uh, a transit pedestrian only um, in Minneapolis. So we may be looking at how we better utilize that, that right of way and, you know, um, We've been kind of moving in one direction quite a bit, um, which is, you know, bikes and pedestrian and in many cases that's that's appropriate. Um, so I don't I'm sorry, I don't really have a good answer for you on that. It isn't something we directly engage with people on. It's a, in public works mainly um, regarding St. Paul. We do work closely with St. Paul. Um, they are partners with us on the Better Buildings state legislation. Um, we uh, have a. Uh, um, our efforts together, um, working with the utility companies as well. They've adopted our benchmarking uh, program. They're adopting our truth and sale of housing program. We collaborate and provide them with opportunities to participate in the Public Utilities Commission because I, I do have a staff person who's really engaged on that as their primary duty where they don't have that. And we have followed their lead on sustainable building policy stuff. So. Um, we do have a lot of uh, overlap in that. And then we also share a lot of uh, similar kinds of um, investments in home energy squads and financing for energy efficiency programs that are very, very similar, if not almost exactly the same. Um, so, and we actually get together too <laughs> with our teams a couple of times a year. It used to be quarterly, but we're going to have our first one in a year on April 21st to share sort of uh, successes and and failures uh, and have some fun. Thank you. So I work closely with them. Dot. Yeah, if I were building a house in Minneapolis, would it be financially feasible to make it all electric, electrify it? Or if I wanted to change the house I have now and electrify it, is it financially feasible to do any of that now? Well, a couple of different ways. One, building a new house, yes, it is very, very much financially feasible um, because you're building in the, the energy efficiency and therefore just reducing the amount of energy you need. So that makes a big difference. Um, going all electric on your home, what we've been doing is looking at studies based on current gas use and income uh, that the costs of using an air source heat pump, uh, which can is like your air conditioner, but can go produce heat as well as cooling. Um, using that in combination with, or what we call a hybrid heating system, uh, in combination with a forced air system, um, has the same operating cost. When you use it, when the natural gas system goes on at 25 degrees or less, and you know only in the sort of like colder time periods of the year mm -hmm. is run. So in those cases, it makes sense to do that. There are some upfront costs to do that, but if you're switching out your air conditioning, for sure it makes sense because you're only gonna have to pay a hundred or two hundred dollars more to have it the sort of reversible heat pump, which provides heating. And you don't have to, and it's already hooked into your system. So there's nothing else you need to do as far as getting it to the fan and the blower and circulating it in your house. So it's a little more challenging to do it when you have a, a natural gas boiler radiator system. But appliances and things like that too are, depends. I mean, people spend on a Viking stove $10,000. You can get an induction stove for like $1,100 or $1,200. So it's a little more expensive than gas, but also um, I didn't even go into that. You know, there's a lot of uh, uh, micro environments off gassing from natural gas too that people don't really realize. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
So Kim, I, I, I'm not even sure what my question means really, but I'm thinking of the debacle with Centerpoint Energy for, out of Houston, Texas. Uh -huh. How is that going to, how are we in the Public Utilities Commission kind of okaying that we pay for it, for that? How does that all work in terms of keeping costs down? Yeah. When we're doing what we're doing, and I don't know really what Houston is doing, um, but how does that work? Yeah, you know, we're the city of Minneapolis is we, we, we what's called intervened as a party to the settlement on that. And so I've been involved directly in negotiations with, with them about it because it's costing the city of Minneapolis, the enterprise, $500,000. And it's costing the people of Minnesota and Center Point Territory $400 million. And basically what happened is that half of our, the half of the gas that, that Center Point had was bought with futures contracts or they had in their already in their tanks and things. The other half is bought through the national spot market. So sometimes gas prices are high, sometimes they're low. They're allowed to buy on the spark market up to 50%. Well, unfortunately, the price of gas for a five day period of time went up like a thousand percent. And so they bought all this stuff on the spot market that is by standard policy allowed to be passed through to the customer. So you'll see a fuel clause on your bill. That is the price of the fuel and more or less they pass that through. So they make a little bit of money on it as it's passing through or a fair amount of money on it passing through, but nonetheless, they pass through the cost. And that is what happened. They bought on the spot market. What we're at, what we are challenging is that they have a responsibility to large consumers such as the city of Minneapolis who have the ability to curtail our gas usage by 20% in a matter of like an hour. Um, we have backup generation systems. We have multiple different ways that we can heat our buildings. We can cycle things. We can drop our temperature sets five degrees. You know, as long as it's not for ad infinite, we can do this kind of stuff, certainly over a five day period of time. Our energy manager called Centerpoint and asked them, them we have a, you know, main account manager and said, should we be curtailing? And they said, no. <laughs> so, Excel actually called St. Paul and told them to curtail. That call that they said no cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars. Think of all the people that were impacted by that. They had supplies in their own stockpile that they didn't actually release. They bought it all on the spot market because they could, they knew they could pass it through. So this is the problem that we have with working with monopolies that do not have necessarily the best interests of the people involved when they're thinking about this stuff. You know, um, it wasn't something they caused, but they're, one, they're the biggest thing in Houston. They had this whole situation and they let that completely ricochet all the way up to here because of, of poor planning from their electrical infrastructure system. So, um, we feel, and, and we're in agreement with Commerce Department and the Office of, of Attorney General Keith Ellison, uh, the Citizens Utility Board, Fresh Energy, we are fighting them to get the, um, the shareholders of Centerpoint to pay for a quarter of this cost at least. And we did have an administrative law judge meeting, um, but you know we haven't gotten to any sort of um, settlement. So it's going to have another long drawn out process. But in the meantime, guess what? It's on your bill. So you're paying for it. <clears throat> we no, did get that. We did get them to stretch it out from 27 months to 60 months, but which because otherwise bills would have been going up by hundreds of dollars a year, like 300. The average bill would have went up $300 a year. Just because something that Houston did that we weren't responsible for. Right. That's what I don't happened. understand. How do we protect ourselves against that? Because I thought it was also related to the fact that they were not, they were not really prepared for this kind of a, an event, and it was irresponsible on their part. 
why are we paying? I don't get it. How do we protect ourselves against that if we're doing all this work to cut down our energy use and then our bills are still jacked up because. Yeah. Well, one thing we're looking at is trying to get a requirement that they inform, they, they send out curtailment or inform people that they're, they're going to experience high energy costs. You know, they, they follow this on a minute by minute basis. They knew there was this tsunami wave coming in and prices maybe 24 hours before it started hitting, you know? So what we needed, but there's nothing in legislation that requires them to notify people to curtail. There's nothing about cost of energy. There's, there's only thing they have to call us to curtail on is because there's going to be a, some kind of health and safety failure of some sort, you know, but so we need to get legislation that protects the consumer. We also need to put in place incentives that they're not incentivized to actually let the bill go to, you know, whatever high level, you know, and, um, and just be like, oh, no big deal. We just passed that through. We need to have incentives that say we, which like we do with conservation improvement program that incentivize them in cases like this to figure out ways to reduce the use of, of gas. Are they, are they the only game in town? Can't we get someone yeah. else to work with? No, nope. they're they're the regulated monopoly. That's they're the only one we can work with. Is that the Texas legislature that has to pass that, or the Minnesota mm -hmm. legislature? Minnesota. That has to Minnesota legislature has to pass that. Texas, they're just like freewheeling down there. So they're like, yeah, you guys have fun with it. Well, guess what? They don't do any conservation. They didn't plan anything out. They have no connection to the rest of the electric grid except for a small connection to the Midwest grid. Otherwise, they're, they didn't want anybody else's grids connecting. So they're the only one that's like one state. And when it goes down, it's down. They can't bring any more power until they restart up power plants. I mean, and they shut down power plants at the exact same time this is all happening. So that it is, I would not be surprised if it happened again um, because ultimately they didn't do much to change that. So do we, we have, have any Minnesota legislators working on a bill to accomplish that? Yeah, Representative Long has been working on a bill to be able to do that. Um, and we're looking at how we can incorporate it into the Public Utilities Commission as well, too, um, which there's lots of comments being taken on that. And there will be more um, on this. Uh, it's called the price spike deal. I can send Ellen information mm -hmm. on that and um, I can send you our position. Do, do you know what the deadline on the commenting time is? Um, it's, uh, I don't, but it, it's, it's um, been through kind of one process then it was gonna settle and then we're gonna have another comment period process. So it's, it's not even up for comment right now, but they so, have multiple comment periods. Just on that same, the same subject, Houston yeah. has no repercussions, the people in Texas. No, they paid their, they were playing through the nodes. It was horrible. People were getting thousand dollar bills for but one I mean, of the days the energy. Gas companies themselves, like they they have no responsibility in this. Nope. Okay. As far this as I know, no one's been charged. This is like, didn't even come close to being like a criminal case. I mean, we're fighting it kind of on legal grounds, but they this is the problem. Like the Public Utilities Commission is, has been the exclusive playground of the utilities. So now that others are getting more involved in it, like we have seen that we can actually shift some opinions on it. They need to be able to have a more open process in Texas, but they don't. You know, their utilities commission has got a bunch of, you know, friends of the governor on it. And, uh, you know, they're all coming from Houston oil businesses. And so it's a very different perspective they have down there. But they don't require the utilities like we do to do conservation programs and to look for ways to be more efficient and to build in, um, safety and redundancy and reliability um it's kind of catch as catch can down there it's the wild west do we have can we get a bill number and information on this bill that representative long is carrying so that perhaps we can get some letters in and find out who we should be thanking for this and who we should be leaning on to support it yes
Unbelievable. Yeah, it's really crazy. And I think it's so weird that um, they rest their case on like, well, we have it written in there that it's just a pass through. And it's like, wait a minute, but you knew it was going to cost your customers a fortune. And you were like, well, no, it's going to find out. So I'm not going to do anything about it. That's the attitude they have. And it's yeah, it so is. frustrating. So we, right. need to, so we need to move on from natural okay. gas to oil. Yes, exactly. Right, But shouldn't we also, since they are a monopoly, this may not be the right term, but, the, but it's the right concept, require them to be a fiduciary in the sense that they must put the interests of their customers hmm. first. Hmm. It seems to me like any legislation short of that doesn't solve our problem. Very good point. Yes, I know there's talking about that within the financial field. It's the same disarray of incentives that causes that kind of problem, like you said, where they're not sure whose bottom line they're looking out for. And fiduciary might be able to address that. That'd be really great. Um, I will send that off and, and uh, get you some connection on that as well. Um, and then, I'm sorry, what was the other thing I was also going to get to Alan on? Oh, it was the PUC on the gas price. That's what I said. I have a quick question, just different subject, uh -huh. um, away from oil and gas. Uh, you, you mentioned home energy squads in St. Paul. Uh -huh. Is that, what is that? And, and does Minneapolis have that? Is that people that yeah. will come to your house to analyze your efficiency? Right. Do yep. we have that available? Yes, it's through the Center for Energy the, and the Environment. Okay. And um, they do both St. Paul and Minneapolis. They're based in downtown Minneapolis. Center for Energy and the Environment, Home Energy Squads is sort of the brand name for it. And yeah, they come in and they do an evaluation of your insulation and your furnace and uh, your opportunities a little bit on solar and look for things like where you might be leaking air around, you know, doors, windows, that kind of thing, and give you a list of things you can do, as well as a list of uh, resources. And we, along with uh, partnering with CenterPoint, um, provide a, a energy, energy assistance center too, where you can, it's a one-stop call where we can set up uh, contractors to bid on your projects and uh, provide opportunities for 0% financing. So we try to roll it all into, into a one-stop shop. So how do people know about this? I mean, I think that would be crucial for everyone to know and to take part in. Yes, well, I, I agree. Think, I think neighborhood associations to some degree have been active in this. I had it done when um, Sidna was subsidizing it. Mm. Um, right. So and, I think your neighborhood association is a point of contact for you. Yeah. And it's available to anybody within CenterPoint or Excel because they actually provide, they pay for the majority of it. Um, yeah. We uh, paid a pittance, you know. Yeah. It's, I think the, the co pay is $100, um, but you can have that waived as well, too. Um, for if you're at or below median income. Okay, I mean, I guess my point is um, more people need to be doing it and more, therefore they, more people need to know that it exists, that it's available. And I, I just don't think the average person really knows that that's a, that's a service that yeah. the city offers. Right. I live yeah. in Lynnhurst and Lynnhurst does provide um, assistance for those types of upgrades, um, but I I don't believe they provide the service. So that would be our gas company or the electrical company. But if you can apply for them, there's zero interest loans, and that's the money that comes from the city. Um, we we, we buy that. down the interest rate. Yeah, we we work with a private finance partner to do the loans. But they're through Center for Energy and the Environment, which is a nonprofit in town. So. We, we basically create like that, you know, buy a new car today and get 0% financing. <laughs> so it's, it's that, that's what we, we do um, to try to sweeten the deal to get people to, to jump on it all at the same time when they got the report and stuff. Okay. 
But we do do a thousand plus of those actually a year. Um, but you're right, we can do more binky. And I, I think that's one of our, not one of our strong suits is, is, um, is getting the information out there too. Yeah, and you do get utility bill stuff on it. We'll send it, we do send something every year in the water bill. If um, just practically, if we go to the Center for Energy and the Environment's website, will we find okay. how to start the process? Yeah, I'm gonna yeah. put it, I'm gonna put it in the, the um, chat. Great, thank you. <clears throat> I, I just wanted to tell you that there are several chat questions. Oh, oh I'm thank sorry. you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, first one. Um, would the condo building that I live in have an energy goal set for it by the city? If not, how would that happen? Um, we, we don't have a goal set by the city. Um, we were, were preempted from setting more restrictive energy efficiency standards and state building code. Um, but what we do is we require buildings that perform in the lowest 25 percentile of similar buildings to do an energy audit. And we work with the utilities to do a combined gas and electric audit and it's no cost to the building to do that. And we're going to be doing about 50 of those this year. Um, so, but if you're interested in uh, um, you, I, I can put my email in here too. You can send me the name of your building and address and I'll check to see where it's at on the benchmarking and whether they'd be eligible for a free energy mm -hmm. audit. Otherwise, if they're performing higher than that, we don't have any requirement to do that. Uh, they just have to, you know, um, report it every year. Thank you. I will. I will do that. I know we're getting all ex new exterior windows. There's 190, oh. 190 units, and oh, that wow. sure will really help. Oh but yeah. You know, it was built in the early 1980s. Sure. So I'm excited that that's happening. Yeah. And we, there's also some programming too of people with uh, on multifamily buildings that we've really been working with Excel to roll out um, to do uh, EV charging to help multifamily big buildings be able to bring EV charging in to their parking ramps and things. Yeah, we're putting some of those in too. Oh, good. Great. Awesome. All right. I one have more a question. Um, is there a plan for Little Earth Housing to go solar? <clears throat> yes. Yeah, we did a solar um, feasibility study on it, and it's a little more challenging to do it on, on the homes um, where, we, where we have good opportunity to put in a pretty big array, 250 kilowatts. So that would be, you know, the equivalent of like uh, 50 houses um, that the uh, we're able to put that on their community centers as well as their it's their administration building. And we're hoping that's where we can also provide battery storage, which can then operate when times are out. Interestingly enough, I used to, li I, I lived downtown for a long time. I, I moved to Bryn Mawr recently and I never had a power outage. Yesterday morning, I had a power outage at like 9.15 and I was working from home. I'm like, what is going on? I can't even figure this out, power outage. I had not had a power outage downtown in like 10 years. But I was told by my neighbors that it actually happens quite often out here in Vietnam. Mm. <laughs> and I was really surprised. Well, we did a little research and uh, the, on Little Earth, actually, and they have, again, not long. The average outage is like 15 minutes, but they have 30 out, some, something around 30 outages a year for sometimes 15 minutes, sometimes four mm. hours. So... Fairly, we, fairly we, high. We have about five in Sydney, but that's a dramatic improvement over what it used to be. Mm. We used to have lots of outages as well. Um, and we just thought it had to do with the transmission facility or, or something. We don't know, but 
we're glad it's better. It's <laughs> you know? good. Might have put and, some new transformers in, yeah. You know, the I had a suggestion for modifying your goals or your your presentation a bit. Sure. On your on the what you can do slide, uh -huh. you said um, don't eat meat twice a week. Yeah. I would change that to eat meat only twice a week if you have to. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know. I, I I always have to be a little careful about how I say that, but yeah, it does. Because really, if you, if if you're only giving up meat twice a week, that's better than nothing. But that isn't going to move the needle. People need to eat uh, dramatically less meat. Yeah, and it's pretty easy to be a near vegetarian. You know, my husband and I eat fish twice a week. You know, so mm -hmm. I'm really I'm in really into that too. So yeah, yeah. I try to keep to my twice a week goal. Um, but yeah, I've dramatically cut down on red meat. That's the really big one. It's yeah, it's but steak, that's, red but, meat. but but your slide expresses it as giving up meat twice a week. Right. The, yes. Uh, I should yeah. I should change that out a little bit. Mm -hmm. I have one more question. It's and, and I've been sitting here trying to figure out how to ask this and if it's a really legitimate question. But my question is, or, or my comment and question is, on the issue of density. And um, does density large cities create more heat? I, I guess I'm framing this question in terms of the entire earth uh -huh. <laughs> and where people are spread out. Now, I know that if people are dense and in one area, they can ride their bicycle to work, they, supposedly, or they can uh -huh. you know, walk to work. But is it, are the, are, is it the, the negative balance out the positive of that? I just, I was, I was just in, a, in another country and, you know, the, the, the view from the airplane with all these people and all these lights spread out over miles and miles of 9 million people, that to me was just a heat. <laughs> it was like this whole piece of the earth that is heated up, i.e. Las Vegas or something. <laughs> that's like density that's creating a lot of heat that's going into the atmosphere. So that's kind of my... Yeah, it's, you know, there's some, there's some similarities there, but, um, you know, ultimately the amount of energy that's used in in multifamily buildings is dramatically less because you don't have four walls exposed to the outside. If you're able to have cut down on, you know, just say 10 or 15 percent of your car trips, um, that can make a, a huge difference. Um, yeah, they produce more heat. It's more um, within a building because or within, you know, having close proximity to people and buildings and the said, I'm I'm concerned about all the heat from all the, the the concrete and the right, but it's not relatively speaking that you know where we have it in producing buildings and things like that. Buildings that are single stories, very spread out, are much less energy efficient per square foot than like high rise office buildings and condos. So mm -hmm. there's a direct correlation between lowering energy use and carbon footprint. Um, overall, like when you look at the community and on a per capita basis, so. So we're not worried, we're not concerned. I'm just asking the question because I'm curious about this. I well, guess. it does have a concern, but it's not related to necessarily the people or what have you, because that's fairly temporary thermal heat where we have things like with the carbon dioxide and methane, for example, they're in the, the, the part of the problem is the cumulative issue is carbon, the carbon dioxide lasts for decades in the atmosphere. So whereas, you know, heat dissipates from people, it's not like a, it's a thermal heat. It's not something that causes being, being trapped in there. So it, there's slightly different ways that they're creating heat. One has a cumulative, very long-term effect. Others are more temporary in the micro environment, meaning like if you move or if the, you know, the sun isn't out or if there's a wind or whatever, but it's not that, that those don't necessarily, those don't affect overall the trend in regards to global warming related to greenhouse gas effect. Okay, thank you. Kim, hopping back to the all the different things that we can do, um, could you share that slide as a PDF too? Sure. Either sure. with me or... Um, yeah, that would be helpful. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. 
I'll pull it out of there and send it to you. I could, I think we could add one. Uh, yeah. One thing I try to do, I'm not successful every week because of when one can get appointments and the like, but I try not to drive one day a week. Hmm. In fact, if I can get more than one day a week in, I'm patting myself on the back, but I try to arrange my schedules so that I always have at least one day a week that I don't use my car. And of course, my next car will be an electric one, but that's not for a while. Yeah, I mean, things like that make a really big difference. I mean, I was to, did an analysis that looked at the, we have about 5,000 employees in the city of Minneapolis, about 2,500 drive in. We were looking at, this is before COVID, ironically, about having hybrid flexible days. Because if you think about just that many cars coming in, you would be able to um, reduce just like by, you know, say not driving in two days a week, you're reducing uh, 2,500, 2,500 back and forth, 10,000 uh, commuter trips in a, in a single week. So 520,000 just by having half those, half those employees uh, that drive in a single car every, every day, not drive in two, two days a week. So it's interesting how this kind of, we of course haven't gone anywhere with it yet, but but if we were looking at how making flexible schedules and looking at ways for people to not drive the car for a day is definitely a, a strategy. And it's really good if you can make those goals clear and sort of easy to understand. Um, I guess it's kind of like dieting too, you know? I mean, if everything's complicated, it's hard to stick with it. Whereas you're like, I'm not driving one day a week, you can understand it. And that's really helpful in getting people to, to take this kind of action because it's not like it's, you know, ruining your quality of life for not driving one day a week, you know, or your life isn't declining because you're not eating steak for four or five days a week. So, <laughs> you know, it's improving, but that's what the future kind of can hold. It's actually a better future, a healthier future, you know, a more interactive with community future and being connected with your environment, kind of understanding the impacts that you have personally. That's, that really will help drive us towards people feeling like they can do something and understanding what they can do. <clears throat> I, I have one more suggestion for the suggestion page. Okay. Um, replace grass with native plantings. Yes. We have talked about that quite a bit and I'm actually talking with someone about that on the Pioneer and Soldier Cemetery, which the city owns. Um, but we actually are just starting a new program now that's going to um, be incentivizing the elimination of all, starting with landscapers, but of fossil fuel based lawn equipment. So right. not mandating it, we're trying to incentivize it out. And we're hoping maybe next year we can work with some local hardware stores to provide like a 50% match for people to get rid of their old lawnmowers. Right. Hennepin County said they'd work with us because, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I'll just sell it on Facebook or whatever marketplace. <laughs> no, we're going to we're going to disassemble it and recycle it and make sure it's not going back in the market. Turn it <laughs> so into no, a already, map. Yeah. So we already talked with Hennepin County on that. And we actually have our first application from a large landscaper that does a bunch of stuff in Kenwood, I know, um, and some other commercial things. They're going to retrofit all their leaf blowers out. Uh, mm -hmm. to electric. So that's kind of one of our, but not a huge thing on GHG emissions, but it is a, it is a quality of life living in the city, you know, noise that, that particulate matter, we don't really measure, but it's in the micro environment, very right. heavy. And for people right. that are using it all day, uh, it's like working in a coal mine on there. Right. But outline it, leaf blowers totally. Uh, Break it. <laughs> got, uh, one more question from the chat, and it looks okay. like maybe Jane maybe had one more question. Um, but we probably should be conscious of the time because it's getting close to eight thirty. Um, and thank you for all this. Um, sure. The question from the chat is: Are there solar? Has any company manufactured solar panels that can melt snow? Um. 
Well, kind of. Um, yeah, it's it's not like they they have to they have to have access to the sunlight in order to generate any electricity. But once they do start moving, the solar cells themselves do heat up, and they are in between the the glass and the backing. They're they're in a vacuum, and so they the heat transfer is very rapid and. Uh, if you can get like a corner of it, that's not, uh, we never recommend people get on the roof and take snow off because the winter time, the lack of sunlight in general, blah, blah, blah. It's not worth the risk, but if you can get a corner of, of it, it will generate from the inside and then it melts off and intended to sort of slide off. Um, but they do generate heat on the inside of them slightly. Um, <laughs> And like I said, because they're in a vacuum, that heat transfer to the glass is really rapid. There's no insulating effect on it. Is the Met Council doing anything? Yeah, the Met Council has been really active on stuff. We, we've uh, they've just recently put together and adopted a, a five-year action plan on um, integrating electric buses and have a long-term plan by like 2030 to be almost entirely electric buses. Um, they currently run the LRT off 100% renewable electricity. Um, they've been doing a lot of work on brownfield site development, for example, to try to do electric um, on there. Um, they're working a lot on doing energy efficiency for the big uh, sewage treatment plant they have, um, mm. which those use a lot when you're moving water around. Like, interest here's a little interesting fact on the city. The city's electric bill is 30% of it's related to moving water. So all the street lights we have, all that, yeah, 30% is related to moving water. All the buildings, we have over 110 buildings, you know, but moving water, because, you know, that's, it's, uh, you got to get it from one place to the next. You got to clean it and pump it and blah, 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 store it. That's where we spend a lot of, so water consumption, and there's a relationship to, to carbon use, but Relatively speaking, it's very efficient for the volume that they do. Water itself only accounts for about 1% of our carbon footprint. So I just had a quick suggestion because when we, on your website, I don't know if you have a dashboard, but if you were to post a dashboard of like the Minneapolis, um, for all, that's all of us, not just city operations, but Minneapolis city, mm -hmm. um, carbon footprint and emissions and how we've actually improved by 30% and what the goal was, and then link it to that, um, that list, that PDF of all the things that we could do. I think that would be a great thing to do because everybody likes a goal and to know kind of, because all the things that you're doing with all of the different utilities and the work that you're doing with all the partners and the, um, the different um, transportation commissions and things like that is certainly contributing a lot to everything. But then we as individual citizens can contribute a lot too. So I think it'd yeah. be great to see a dashboard up there and see the improvements that have already been made, but then how we can contribute to moving it forward in the future. Yeah, it's a good suggestion. I, <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm gonna try to make some of those improvements in there. We, we had a kind of switch over of the website from COVID, but in general, I, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not great, I'm sorry. So, but it's a good suggestion <laughs> that we try to get some more data out there, out there. and it's not consolidated anywhere, so we're kind of, around on a bunch of pages on energy and then housing and so. Well, you have great well, data, you know. I've got, I got good data, right? But it's not being displayed or yeah. put out in there any <laughs> appropriate way, so. But this was a great presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, thank you. Say, this is the liveliest Q&A we've had all year. <laughs> 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 you know, um, you know, people were really interested in this and thank yeah. you for all this great information. It's, it's been wonderful. Um, and just to my fellow, yeah, league uh, members too, um, I just saw Gwen is on the call as well. She's also on the State League Climate Change Task Force. And if you go to the League of Women Voters Minnesota website, you can sign up to get updates from oh. um, that task force work cool. so we can continue learning and, uh, and doing. So thanks everyone for joining us. Um, huge thank you, Kim Havey.
and um, look forward to seeing you all next month. Absolutely. Yeah. Take care. Thank you so much. And thank you. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. This thank was you. great. Thanks, Kim. Thanks. Great. Thanks.